Okay, so uh, thanks for coming everybody to today's lecture on cannabis and the law. And uh, it's an important topic, but when I want to qualify myself for right away, I'm not a lawyer. Uh, a lot of people are going to be watching this online later, and I want to qualify myself in terms of where my opinions are coming from. It's not uh, a legal opinion as much as it is a, a lay opinion. And so, uh, anything I, I say, uh, it, you know, if you're going to uh, break the law, uh, you might want to double check uh, any, any of the, the facts I might give. I, I hope I'm correct, but uh, I wouldn't want anybody to do something and use my, my arguments uh, in, in court without a lawyer backing them up. And so, uh, yeah, cannabis and the law is a very important topic and there's uh, several areas to discuss so um, I'm going to talk uh, today about uh, a couple of case law that have been working their way through the courts um, in particular the, the Murnau decision and uh, the Owen Smith decision regarding the Cannabis Buyers Club of Victoria Cannabis Buyers Club I guess now um, and uh, those cases both being medical Certainly, uh, a lot of the discussion I'm having today will be about the medicinal uses of cannabis. Um, and, uh, yeah, that, that will be the, the primary focus of today. Although, I will talk a little bit about uh, Dean Larson's uh, campaign and uh, decriminalization and uh, how we can help possibly change the law instead of just our re reaction to it. Um, And uh, I'm going to start uh, by discussing uh, the law more generally instead of just medicinal in terms of more recent laws uh, that have come into effect. Bill C-10 by our federal government um, has uh, a host of um, mandatory minimums in included in uh, what are primarily drug offenses. Um, and uh, these uh, mandatory minimums were explained very well by uh, our lawyer, uh, Kirk Tussaw, um, who a few weeks ago uh, did a presentation in Vancouver on mandatory minimums. And if anybody wants a, a legal opinion on what the current mandatory minimums are, um, I strongly advise you to, to watch that film, uh, as he uh, does give many details about mandatory minimum sentences and how they could potentially apply to uh, dispensaries such as the uh, Cannabis Buyers Club because there are a number of concerns for people running dispensaries that are now uh, subject to these. Um, and so uh, I guess uh, the uh, mandatory minimum sentences um, come into play for both people that are uh, trafficking in uh, cannabis and, and its derivatives uh, as well as for, for growing uh, cannabis. Um, I won't claim to be able to remember exactly what all the punishments are for each. Um, I do know when it comes to trafficking cannabis, if you have more than three kilograms on you, um, the mandatory minimums go up substantially. Um, and uh, also, if any uh, aggravating factors um, exist when a person is arrested, um, mandatory minimums go up uh, quite often, uh, three months uh, per aggravating factor, uh, as I understand. Um, so each aggravating factor could be an extra three months on top of the offense. Sorry, what do you mean by aggravating factor? Like resisting arrest or? Um, I don't think resisting arrest is an aggravating factor. They've got a, a list of them. Uh, the aggravating factors include being in a school. Oh, okay. Um, when it comes to growing cannabis, um, which I'm a little bit more familiar with, um, uh, but I think trafficking applies to as well if it's uh, frequented by children, separate from being in a school. Um, for growing, it, an aggravating factor is being in a residential area. So if uh, you know, you're know you caught growing in, in your home, uh, if it's uh, a rented property, that is a separate aggravating factor. And so most people rent in residential areas, 
and so those two separate factories mean an extra six months mandatory on top of if it was six plants uh, that, that you were caught for the purpose of trafficking um, or between six and, and 199 um, is the six months and above the 200 or more I believe it's two years up to 499 and then above 500 um, wrong, but I think it's a five-year sentence. But, gotcha. um, but anyway, uh, there's a couple more aggravating factors. A gun, if you have a gun present, or if you have booby traps, those are other aggravating factors. Okay, but Thank the you. one, uh, the, you know, the, 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 the ones that come up with the, the, that are the most bizarre in a sense are the, the fact that you can't do it in a rented property. Um, if you do it on your own property, they'll take it from you. So they, they got you either way, they're either going to take your property or consider it an aggravating factor that you didn't own it and then punish you more for it somehow. Um, so that's the one that really is just totally twisted to me, but they're, they're all twisted. Um, and so, uh, yeah, these uh, um, mandatory minimums, um, have, uh, uh, I guess, uh, a few possible mechanisms in place for people to uh, 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 avoid them possibly entirely um, in, in certain ways, or for the Crown and police not to have them come into effect. Um, one of them I sort of hinted on was that um, for the, the, the growing part, you have to have possession for the purpose of trafficking uh, to be subject to a mandatory minimum. Um, that offense is separate from production of a controlled substance. Production of a controlled substance, which is a sec essentially growing cannabis, um, does not carry a mandatory minimum. Uh, we had a grower at our club get busted a couple years ago, stupid chimney fire. Um, they uh, uh, arrested him, he had a couple, over a couple hundred plants, 230 plants or something like that. Um, and in the, the plea bargain, um, the possession for the purpose of trafficking was dropped. He was found, you know, guilty, uh, you know, or, you know, pled uh, uh, guilty for the offense of production of controlled substance, and even though it was over the 200 plants, uh, under the new laws, he wouldn't have been subject to a mandatory minimum um, without the PPT. And so, um, you know, there's been a lot of concern about, you know, six plants, six months, but they have to convict you of for the purpose of trafficking, which depends a lot on the judge. Some judges don't think they need much evidence at all. If you had two baggies in your cupboard and, and, and an old scale in the basement, for me, that's enough for them to think you're a trafficker. Um, for other judges and other circumstances, they'd have to hold the bar much higher. Technically, sharing is trafficking. I've you know, done time for sharing, so I, I know that quite well. Um, but in order to prove that someone is, is sharing in, in a court uh, in such a way to prove possession for the purpose of trafficking, um, might be more difficult, um, but uh, um, so y you have to have the charge of, of PPT on. Um, another interesting nuance is that the Crown has to inform you that they're going to uh, subject you to these mandatory minimums. So you could be facing uh, possession for the purpose of trafficking charge um, of you know the, the growing it or or dealing it in hash or whatever. And if the Crown doesn't actually you know, send you a formal letter saying that you're going to get uh, a mandatory minimum, apparently, and this is still very early on in, in Bill C-10 coming into effect, but apparently they can't come up later and say that in, in sentencing you, you should be uh, given a mandatory minimum. Um, at least that's what it seems to be written. As. One of the other possible outs in the new uh, laws are around drug treatment programs. Apparently. You can avoid a mandatory minimum if you go into a drug treatment program, um, which uh, you know might not be much more than you know just testing you know clear for uh, THC for however many months you've got to go through the treatment program. Um, but there isn't a definite time period stated in these laws. It's like you have to go through six months of treatment or six hours or six years. It just says you have to have gone through a drug treatment program. Um, which in the United States is big fucking business, excuse me, French, but there's a lot of companies that are making really good money through drug treatment programs as part of their uh, strategy, I guess, of uh, controlling the, the people 
do. Uh, and so uh, um, there are uh, financial interests in, in involved in you know, promoting that end of things. But if it comes down to testing clear for cannabis as opposed to going to jail and just, you know, going to these silly little meetings and saying that you don't like pot anymore, uh, then it's better than jail. So I'm sure that there'll be many people that will, you know, try to off that route rather than go with a mandatory minimum sentence. And it's unclear, again, it's so early, uh, whether or not, uh, um, you know, people can request that and automatically be granted such an opportunity or whether, whether it's up to the judge. Or, I'm not 100% sure. But there are uh, a few um, ways legally that people might avoid these mandatory minimums. Um, but one would also like to think that there are thoughtful police officers in Crown that uh, would uh, act in such a way that, that no one would be facing a mandatory minimum unless they were a, a real threat to the community and they, in, in the eyes of the law, being caught multiple crimes and, and behaving in such a way that, that, uh, that they you know, feel the community safer without them being in, in, in the public. Um, to my knowledge, there hasn't been yet um, anyone arrested and charged uh, facing these mandatory minimums uh, in, in Canada that um, is, you know, just kind of the average, you know, pothead, medical user, what have you. Um, I understand that there are some cases proceeding, but they are with the, you know, kind of profile that the government has said they're going after with these mandatory minimums. So to date, um, they've been uh, testing these laws out in cases that ideally suit the profile they're looking for. Right? Whether or not that continues over time is, is to, to remain because they may be, you know, again, trying out these new laws and seeing uh, how they stand up in court um, using cases where they wouldn't have a constitutional argument like they will. Um, we're going to get to it at, at the end here with patients that continue to grow next year after they lose their license and, you know, supply their friend next door with some, and, uh, you know, that kind of uh, situation, I don't think the, the, the mandatory minimums would stand up against. I'll kind of get to the MMAR and that more towards the end. But uh, certainly um, at this point, um, uh, they've been using the, the law uh, and, and, uh, as they, they intended. Um, and so, uh, in some ways, we, we can hope that it stays that way until such time as these laws can be repealed by future governments. I'm going to talk about Dana's campaign before switching over to medical stuff. So, um, Dana Larson uh, started out the Sensible BC campaign. Uh, it was about a year ago, um, actually, it, it was at our convention last year that Dana first publicly announced what he was doing. And so, uh, um, I'm uh, quite certain, hey, um, uh, so, so it's, it's barely been a year since Dana announced uh, his campaign to uh, change uh, the possession laws, essentially here in Canada, or here in BC. Um, and he, he's done a, a very good job looking into uh, what we can do with the law. Um, here in Canada, it's quite different than the United States where, um, you know, Washington State, Colorado um, made it legal through ballot initiatives. Um, every state in the U.S. has ballot initiatives. It's one of the main ways through which they express their, their democratic ideals down there. It's been a part of their their political culture since the very beginning. Um, the United States, you know, made a much more democratic system in, in the beginning, and, and the ballot initiative was, uh, or initiatives were really uh, a, a mechanism uh, to, to do that. And, and so, uh, you know, the uh, ballots that, that they've been having down there for years uh, to make both medical marijuana legal and to decriminalize uh, possession um, have been, uh, very, uh, very much akin to uh, other ballot initiatives in, in the United States. Again, that's kind of how their process works. Here in Canada, we're not used to that at all. Um, the uh, 
only, and I believe the only other ballot initiative to be successful in this country has been the HST. Um, it's never occurred in any other province. This is the only province that's got a ballot initiative system that can probably work at all for anything. It's because they've got the bar so high in other provinces for the amount of signatures you have to collect and stuff that it's virtually um, impossible for any, any group to do so. And so, um, you know, we're really quite fortunate here in British Columbia to have, on one hand, the, the most successful ballot system, one that has just been tested and <coughs> successful. You know, if, if the HST had failed, it might not look so good on us. But, you know, it seems like, you know, the path has been, been uh, beaten down a little bit for us with that. Um, so on one hand, we have the only province in the, in the country with the ballot system that can work, and we've got the most progressive cannabis uh, community in, in the country, where people like Dana Larson have the means, motive, and opportunity to make this their, their, their job to do this. And so, um, you know, it's something that uh, the, the combination of, of these, you know, different factors have really given us an opportunity to, to, to do it. And, and I think Dana's the perfect person for it. And so uh, it's uh, uh, also uh, going to help the, the rest of the country make this uh, issue in the next federal election both the recreational use of cannabis and the medical use, uh, which is separately putting itself kind of on the agenda. And between the two forces, uh, I, I think that the next federal election, you know, cannabis policy you know, will be on the table. And uh, hopefully, with, with the conservatives being taken out uh, and, and a new minority government of some kind of monster coming in, uh, we can see uh, new and, and uh, reasonable uh, laws coming into effect. So we're kind of holding out for that, right? And so for those of us working in the industry, it's really quite scary times to have these mandatory minimums coming into place. And, and, uh, and it's a couple of years you know, before we, we see the next federal election. And so, especially for those of us in, in BC, we, we have this chance uh, to, to turn things around and build off of the momentum in the United States that, that's occurred. And so um, it's uh, something that the, the real trick is going to be in the collection of signatures. Um, we will win when the actual vote occurs. You know, any poll right now shows that the vast majority of the population supports these kinds of initiatives. Um, people won't be scared to vote. Whereas people now that smoke pot or grow it are not so keen on putting down their information onto a signature list. So we have a certain amount of inertia that's happening against the signature collection that won't be happening when the actual vote occurs as well. Um, and so uh, we have September, October, November that we're um, going to be collecting signatures. So um, that, that's going to be the key. If we get all the signatures we want, I think it's 400,000 we need in the province, but we need a certain percentage from each riding, and that's going to be where it's going to be uh, a real trick towards the end of October um, and uh, into November. We'll be starting to strategically uh, target the ridings that we're not getting enough signatures from, because certainly in the lower mainland in particular, there'll be some ridings that might be more difficult than others. And uh, yeah, so um, normally uh, we have no other you know, recourse to challenge the law. Um, and this is the only initiative of its kind. Um, if it doesn't do it this time, uh, it's, I don't think Dana will attempt it again. Um, you know, it's kind of a one-shot deal. And uh, I, I think BC's ready for it. Dana's done a good job uh, campaigning. He's got a whole bunch of events happening on the mainland. And otherwise, you know, stay tuned to that one. I'm going to switch over to court, which is really what the law is about. Yeah. I had two pages of signatures this morning. Good job. Cool. Oh, were you doing the thing yeah, here today? Yeah, I had a sign-up table. Oh, I thought that was next month. Yeah. You did it. Oh, shit. Yeah, it was today. I had a, a helper who's there right now. Okay. Cool. So, Sorry. For we're going to do it I thought again. it was November, March yeah. 27th. Yeah, we'll they have to it. officially re-sign in yeah. September, right? Now. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, this is more collecting for volunteers. Information so you can get back to yeah. Um, 
And thanks for all your good work with the campaign too. So. We'll good be on. doing it again in a few weeks. Cool. Um, yeah, so I'm going to uh, talk about the Murnau case uh, for Owens. Um, Matt Murnau is a uh, patient in uh, Toronto, Ontario now, where uh, I don't claim to know the exact time. Um, he uh, got arrested uh, growing some pot uh, a couple of years ago. I can't remember exactly when it was. Um, Matt ha has been an activist for quite a few years, uh, working with a group out of Hamilton that were calling themselves the Hash Mob back in the late 90s, I believe. Um, and, uh, He's uh, been a very uh, vocal advocate for, for legalization and, and medical use. Um, but Matt was unable to get a doctor's uh, signature to get a Health Canada form, so um, he um, was illegally growing when he was busted, obviously. Anyway, um, he wanted to argue that uh, the program, uh, as it stands, the uh, Marijuana for Medical Access program uh, is unconstitutional because the access is illusionary. Um, the argument is akin to that used by Henry Morgenthaler, um, who back in the 1980s, um, in one of the very first uh, test cases of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, um, successfully argued that the abortion program that the federal government um, apparently uh, had was unconstitutional because it was illusionary. Not that the government didn't have a program, but that there's so many barriers, so many bureaucratic you know, delays and, uh, and, and such paperwork and, and intrusive um, you know, uh, measures um, that the law was you know, unconstitutional. Um, he was able to prove that um, in, in part because he had uh, numerous um, provincial um, statutes that were obviously meant to create barriers uh, to abortion, um, committees and things that, that young women would have had to apply to and, and argue for, for the abortion in front of that were quite um, uh, intrusive. And uh, um, again, uh, the, the Morgan Taller decision, as, as, as many might know, um, was one of the first uh, where the charter was was used to protect, um, you know, so-called criminal acts uh, uh, against you know, bad government laws. Ironically, in a way this is sort of similar, the, the government's never actually passed abortion laws um, after this. Um, they're, they're afraid to for various factions, and so there isn't a, a law in Canada that, that dictates abortions must be included in the services, and a lot of health regions uh, will not include abortions. Or keep these barriers uh, up um, because the government's not created a law forcing the, the provincial governments to, to do this. But uh, it's illegal to stop someone from providing an abortion, which is quite strange. But somewhat similar to where we are at with medical marijuana. Um, so Matt um, not only uh, wanted to argue that the program was illusionary for him, but for people all across Canada. And as many know, um, doctors have uh, refused, uh, for the most part, to participate in the uh, program. Um, the College of Physicians and Surgeons has uh, sent out a letter, or, you know, and, and did so very quickly after the program came out, um, telling doctors not to participate in the program, that they would be liable for um, any and, and all problems that resulted from their patient's use of this unknown drug. And uh, even though there's a, a form out that waives doctors of any liability, um, the uh, uh, College of Physicians and Surgeons has been very persuasive, um, and the, the vast majority of doctors in Canada uh, do not sign the, the forms. I, I forget the exact percentage, but it's, it's a very small percentage of doctors that are signing forms. Um, and so uh, Matt, um, wrong, but I think it was 19 affidavits uh, he collected. Um, quite a few um, uh, patients from across Canada that had had a series of uh, problems 
uh, trying to get licenses uh, from physicians. I was actually always had a question about, <coughs> excuse me, like I heard um, from people I know down in you know, California, right, that um, basically like in a way like abuse the medical marijuana system down there, they, they even call them like green doctors or something, like doctors that will very easily sign a form if you give them some BS, like oh I hurt my back or oh I did this, they'll just be like sure, here's your license. So I'm just wondering like why it seemed, it was like, um, were doctors down in the states given like a similar ultimatum, like they can't, like they, were they ever really discouraged to, um, to, to, to not sign papers and why does it seem that like so many people down in the state seem just like, you, I can see why like California doesn't really legalize because like half, the, most of the people that smoke pot are already abusing the system anyway, so it's like why even bother? Yeah, down in California you basically pay a doctor like 50 bucks and they'll sign your form. So it's, it's strange now because, you know, anybody with, with money has got the legal permit, but, you know, sort of poor people or people with English not being their first language often find themselves still being busted because they haven't gotten their license yet. So it's a strange system, but um, I don't know if it's going to change either because people seem quite happy. Um, I don't know all the nuances, but I think in the States the doctors are licensed uh, by the state and not by the federal government. Okay. So which is the big difference, right? So right. that in the state of California, no problem, sign as many as you want. Um, here in Canada, we've been having very similar problems with doctors signing licenses without checking up on medical information. Um, a couple just got busted in Vernon this week, even. Um, and so, uh, unfortunately, that's happening here, but it's not for 50 bucks. They're taking hundreds of dollars and signing people licenses to print money under the new system, right? So, uh, yeah, our system's being taken advantage of uh, in, in a different way than, than the one in California. <coughs> but, uh, you know, it, it, what it comes down to is any medical problems going to be taken advantage of um, by, you know, the rest of us, in, in a sense, uh, in, in order to, um, you know, try to avoid persecution of the law. Because no one in their right mind is going to, yeah. And so, um, you know, it's, it's going to be impossible to, have a medical marijuana program where there's no um, diversion or people taking advantage of it from outside. Um, but uh, certainly uh, California is proving that more than others. So yeah, so Matt got uh, uh, a lot of pages to, to fill out uh, affidavits. And uh, last year, sorry, I'm not good on the dates of, of this case. Um, but uh, was it even last year? No, sorry, the year before. Um, a, a judge uh, in Ontario uh, agreed with him and uh, struck down the medical marijuana access regulations as being unconstitutional uh, for not providing access and, and for being Ill illusionary. And uh, that was a, a very hopeful decision for people in the movement because um, like even now I think there's 26,000 patients with licenses to possess or grow cannabis. Um, in a country where the federal government's admitted in various studies that there's approximately a million Canadians in chronic pain. And if you include people that have got mental health issues using uh, prescription drugs, you know, for eating and sleeping and stuff, um, there's another three million people. So there's about four million Canadians that are using uh, drugs of one type or another or, or, you know, taking therapy of one type or another for which cannabis would be a, a viable alternative. And so it's, it's a very, very small fraction of the number of patients that are, are gaining uh, access in, into the program. And so, uh, um, you know, the, like I say, you know, there was a, a lot of joy when this decision came down and uh, the government was, was told to fix their, their programs. Um, it was interesting that when the new regulations came in, though, uh, Matt's case wasn't cited as, as one of the, the cases that was causing them to change their program. Uh, and I'll get to the new regs uh, at, at the end. But uh, it wasn't long after Matt's uh, decision uh, that the government started to um, uh, announce that they were going to be uh, coming up with new regulations and uh, improve the uh, current system. And so uh, it seems as though um, a lot of the new program, in my opinion, was 
created to deal with some of these issues because i think matt proved to a certain point um that the values was faulty and it was it obviously is to many of us and it's kind of ironic that health canada has argued time and time again in the murdaugh decision and barron before that and 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 others that the system was good enough as it stood that they didn't need to to make any changes that it was working and that's what they've argued up until murnau and then all of a sudden they're coming up with a completely new system um well then they they shouldn't have been able to argue that the last one was fine if if in fact they're going to come up with something quite different um but uh in in the murnau case uh um, that that was their position was that the access uh, to the the system wasn't a problem um and then it was uh, appealed by the government uh to the ontario court of appeal which has now looked at this issue three times the the uh, regulations were originally really forced upon the government by the uh, ontario court of appeal back in uh, july 2000 they gave the government a year to come up with the medical marijuana program um actually even going back to earlier decisions in ontario that forced the exemption system in the first place and then uh the court of appeal looked at the regulations in the hitzig decision and in 2003 they they ruled that uh, law was unconstitutional, that access needed to improve, that uh, supply needed to be opened because at that point there's nowhere for patients to even get any supply. And so uh, when uh, the Murnau decision was going to the Court of Appeal in Ontario, we were uh, quite uh, happy with that. We figured that the the court would stand up uh, behind the earlier decision. Um, However, uh, not having been at the original uh, proceedings. I didn't know exactly, you know, what evidence had been entered into court. Uh, I, I've seen a lot of court. I'm actually going to be up in court next week, watching another day and a half. Um, it's really important uh, how you enter your evidence and how you enter the evidence of your expert witnesses and qualify your expert witnesses when you're in court. Um, and uh, in particular, if you're arguing that that there's a, a constitutional flaw in the law. You, you need some good expert witnesses. You, you need some solid evidence that they can use in their arguments, and you need good evidence even from your your witnesses that the expert can can then can then use. Um, my my understanding, and, and again, I haven't read the transcripts and wasn't present, but my understanding is that not only were there no experts um, in the Murnau decision, uh, um, which is quite rare for a judge to make a constitutional decision without hearing from any experts at all. I, I don't think that's quite uh, the norm. Uh, but uh, not, not only were, were there no experts present, um, but my understanding upon reading the, the Court of Appeal decision is that um, none of the patients uh, submitted any medical evidence um, on, on paper, and that they all wrote uh, you know, their story in affidavit form and presented that to the court. Um, only four patients testified. This is Toronto. Like they, they could have had more than four patients in Toronto testify. But they brought these affidavits from across the country, which aren't held to the same standard in court. If the Crown can't cross-examine a, a witness, their evidence isn't given as much weight. And so instead of filling the courtroom with all these people in Toronto that lacked access and had documentation to prove they had you know, the conditions they, 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 they claimed, um, it appears as though um, Matt and his lawyers entered all their evidence in anecdotally, with, with nothing on paper to back up any of the medical problems that, that these patients have. Um, and knowing some of them, they, they have the medical problems, but I guess they just didn't enter in the evidence. And the, the lower court judge just bought it all. He's agreed, and, and you know, because the Crown didn't provide any evidence to the contrary, he took everything they said as true and made his decision you know, based upon that. Um, which in some matters might be okay, but when you're ruling that the federal government is wrong, you need some good hard evidence. You can't just make claims without substantiating them. And, and unfortunately, it seems as though that's what's happened in the Murdoch decision. And we went from a lower court uh, ruling in, in his favor to um, a unanimous decision against him uh, that just came down uh, about a month ago, unfortunately. And uh, not only did the judges, you know, kind of all uh, agree um, that uh, the, the uh, evidence was, was weak, 
Um, but at the end, uh, one of the judges, who's been a judge in, in all of these cases back you know, over the last decade, um, Judge Doherty uh, kind of spelled out what would be required to prove the law was illusionary, which is really beneficial to someone like myself because, you know, in, in many ways, uh, uh, having a judge, you know, kind of give you the the, uh, the the rules of the game in terms of what you would need to prove uh, to to convince them of, of your, your position, you know, that's not very common, um, and so we're quite thankful for that. Uh, on the other hand, um, the, the tone of, of the ruling is, is one that um, really makes it clear how difficult that standard will be, that to prove the law is illusionary. Um, in, in this case, we would not only need this, this letter from the College of Physicians and Surgeons, but we would need information proving that the government itself did things to um, stop or, or limit access. And the College of Physicians and Surgeons isn't actually the government. That's a college. It's a separate body. So um, with the college, because that's not even a government agency. The government itself uh, has done nothing to impede the uh, access to, to the medical marijuana system, uh, according to, to the law. And uh, unfortunately, without any you know doctors or experts presenting any information to the court, uh, uh, about uh, the climate in the medical community in regards to these programs, um, there, there was nothing but, but hearsay for the courts to, to deal with in terms of what the patients said about what their doctors said. Um, and so the, the evidence uh, really you know, wasn't uh, what it should have been, what it could have been, if, uh, in, in my opinion, uh, a more uh, serious approach was taken on it. Um, and so it's, it's unfortunate, uh, and, and you probably hear it in the tone of my voice, because um, a bad precedent like th this is very difficult to, to go back against. Um, you know, and in court, um, precedent you know, really sets up you know, everything to, to the point where I mentioned I'm going to court next week for uh, Ernie and uh, the North Island Compassion Club up island. Well, Ernie tried to argue for a constitutional hearing. Uh, but he got shut down, and, and he's got three days for his entire court case, including his constitutional hearing, because according to the judge, this medical marijuana stuff has been dealt with so many times, he's not going to give more time for people like us to you know, just uh, spout off you know, our beliefs. You know, the courts have really um, you know, become you know, tired of, of this issue keep coming up. And, certainly we're tired of having to get up in front of the courts too because these laws are ridiculous. So we, we feel that as well, but unfortunately they're the ones with the power that can decide how many days we get in court to argue or, or other you know, mechanisms that uh, really um, dictate the, the outcome. And so, uh, yeah, so, so it's very unfortunate that we have this, this uh, precedent. Now, Matt's appeal to the Supreme Court of Canada. In my opinion, there's not much of a chance the Supreme Court of Canada is going to look at the, this. Um, um, usually, th there's got to be at least one dissenting judge of the three before the Supreme Court will look at it. And even then, they don't always look at it if they agree with the decision. And having read the decision, if, if in fact it's true that the, the evidence they submitted was strictly at, at, anecdotal, uh, I don't think I'd want the Supreme Court to look at it because they're going to lose and, and lose badly. So it's, it, you know, hopefully the Supreme Court doesn't look at it, and uh, um, it's uh, something that uh, I don't. The Crown has the option of having another trial, um, but I don't know if they have declared their intent. We're going to have time to talk about Owen's trial here, so I'm going to finish off with our stuff about three years ago. Actually, I'm going to back up. Um, my uh, store, I guess, uh, when it was the Cannabis Buyers Club of Canada, got raided four times back in 2002, 2003. Um, a week ago Monday was our 10-year anniversary of our last raid on our store. So uh, we beat every single charge that was laid against us. Um, but the second trial, um, I was originally uh, convicted of selling cannabis resin in the food and the skip products. And uh, it surprised me because going into trial, I, uh, you know, we'd already beaten uh, charges of trafficking cannabis uh, with the club, and the, the Crown, you know, admitted that they weren't going to pursue that, but that they were going to pursue the cannabis resin charge. 
well, I got busted with hash, so I figured the resin charge was with hash, right? But it was the food and skin products. And uh, then um, it became clear uh, that the Crown is arguing that the MMAR did not include cannabis resin or any other derivatives from the cannabis plant, and that the, the regulations allowed for dried marijuana and dried marijuana only. And so, um, after I lost, I was so upset at my lawyer and the Crown and, and the judge and everybody that I did the appeal myself. I'd never done anything like that before, but uh, my lawyer was really busy. Uh, Bob Moore Stewart's a wonderful man, but um, he, he wasn't getting paid a lot of money in, in a lot of cases, so he couldn't focus on it like I wanted to. So I wrote the factum and uh, handed it into the, the Department of Justice. I don't even think he or any other lawyer read it. I just wrote my arguments out and handed it in. Uh, the Department of Justice recognized that at least I should get a new trial, uh, and they didn't want to go ahead with that. And so uh, I got in front of the Court of Appeal when they were dropping the charges against me, and I argued to the court that um, I wanted to proceed with this matter, that uh, dropping the charges against me at this point um, left the law on the books, and that uh, if we didn't look at it now, we were just going to have to deal with it later. And the Crown told me that the Department of Justice is conceding, the charges are being dropped against me, I'm a free man, and there's nothing that they could do. And I'm like, well, we're going to be back here, because this isn't over. And so uh, when our bakery got raided three years ago, um, right away I knew that this was the case. This was the opportunity that we had to, to challenge these laws. In fact, it was funny, because it didn't look like the charges were going through for the first little while, and we got nervous. And uh, I sent out, or the press kind of reported, oh, it doesn't look like the charges are coming, and then they charged them. Um, and Because, yeah, the first time we went to court, there was nothing even on the docket to try and that. And so, uh, you know, we, we actually weren't happy about that, though, because we, again, wanted to, to pursue this matter fully. And so, uh, Owen got charged with trafficking in THC, again, a separately listed drug from cannabis um, and from cannabis resin. Um, they, they stopped charging us with cannabis resin, though, um, because we were able to prove uh, through the uh, testimony of Dr. David Pate um, that uh, resin, as, as it was understood, uh, wasn't present in, in the cookies that you know, THC was, um, but not actual resin. So you may know of the watermelon decisions in uh, the, the Vancouver where she was busted selling cookies on Wreck Beach. Um, it was uh, Dr. Pate that helped get those charges dropped. Um, proving again that it wasn't cannabis resin in the cookies. And so uh, um, I, I worked with Dr. Pate as well uh, when I got convicted of giving away cookies back in 2005, but Dr. Pate was my expert witness. He um, was one of the first charged and convicted of trafficking THC for that because they lost with uh, watermelon charging her with cannabis resin in the cookies. So they kind of switched and charged me with trafficking in THC and it stuck because there's a little bit of THC in the cookies. And I actually, I, I tried to argue that there's so little THC in the cookies that it was below 0.5%, which is legally allowed under hemp, so that it was, you know, uh, uh, low dosage uh, and, and legal, but, but they didn't buy that. They were cookies. Um, so uh, anyway, um, Yes, yeah, so Owen was uh, charged with trafficking in THC, which um, is quite interesting given that synthetic THC is for sale, $8 a pill, you can buy it. It's uh, uh, sold as Marinol, Sesamat, um, Dravenol, I think is the other um, with commercially available THC. With what? prescription, no? Yeah, with prescription, yeah. And it's just THC though, right? Um, the other uh, legally available THC is uh, Sativix. Uh, which is uh, plant-based, um, which has a one-to-one -one ratio with CBD, which is another active cannabinoid in the cannabis plant. Um, interestingly, Dr. Pate, who testified for us, um, helped uh, JW Pharmaceuticals develop the strain that they use uh, for sativics. That's one of his areas of experience. In fact, Dr. Pate um, is as much the Crown's witness as ours. Um, he's done uh, extensive research in, in the field and uh, when, uh, in, if you get Health Canada's um, standard operating procedures for laboratory testing in cannabis and cannabinoids um, and go to the uh, B 
bibliography of scientific studies that they use, um, his name is mentioned in about like 80 or 90 percent of the different studies that have been done, either as the primary investigator or one of the other investigators in the, in the research. So he's more the Crown's witness than ours in, in some sense. He has worked in the pharmaceutical industry for so long that uh, um, he, he's uh, yeah, quite, quite well, well versed in, in the matter. And so bringing him to court uh, was very uh, good for us and very impressive for the judge because he, you know, he's among the most knowledgeable in, in the world on the matter. And his, his resume is, is very impressive. And uh, the language that he was able to use for the court was, was wonderful as well because he could take these really, you know, at times complex scientific theories and, and break it down for the judge to understand the, the nuances of it. And, and that goes from describing on one hand how no one can die from consumption of THC. That if this phone was 100% THC and I started chewing on it, the worst that would happen would be I would need to pass out. That this will not stop my heart from working or it wouldn't stop my, my uh, lungs from, from operating. Uh, other you know, drugs, opiates and such, for example, would stop your heart from working. But, you know, cannabis is just gonna knock you out. So he did a good job articulating some of these things to, to the judge. And then on the other hand, uh, he really knows the plant uh, exceptionally well and uh, did a, a wonderful job. It was great. We had this little uh, almost slideshow presentation of trichomes where there's these pictures of trichomes that uh, the, the uh, judge was, was being shown and, and Dr. Pate was describing how these trichomes are formed and how THC is uh, you know, made by the plant and that the crystals that form on the leaf of the plant are primarily made up of THC and, and that um, they are uh, it, uh, you know, in some sense uh, the, the plant's defense mechanism against insects and, and disease and to dry the plant and separate the crystal from the plant material um, and then make the, the actual crystal illegal it, it is um, it, it goes against you know scientific principles. He, he did a great job comparing it to a maple tree and saying that if the leaf fell off the maple tree, that it would become illegal, and, and, or if you made maple syrup, you know that would somehow be illegal even if the maple tree was legal. You know, that's the, he used a, a good analogy for that, um, and so Dr. Pate did such a good job that the judge quoted five pages of his evidence in the decision. Um, and uh, that's really important leading up to the Court of Appeal decision uh, because uh, the, the Court of Appeal um, doesn't hear any new evidence. They look at the old evidence and kind of the, the judge's decision and the summary of it. So the judge did an excellent job summarizing his position. On, on the other hand, Health Canada did a, a dismal, a dismal, uh, job defending um, their position. And <coughs> I, I say that because the doctor that they sent, Dr. Abramovich, um, has never studied the cannabis plant. He's never done research on it. Um, the most work that he'd done in the field was uh, spending three months compiling research that he put together in a document for healthcare practitioners. Um, Health Canada had an old one they wanted kind of you know, updated. So he spent three months updating their um, their guidelines for practitioners, um, and so he wasn't able to speak with any confidence on the matter in court. You know, he could talk about what he remembers reading other people doing, whereas Dr. Pate was citing all his work and work of other people in the field that he knew very well. Um, but uh, what what happened that ruined Dr. Abramovich was when Kirk started questioning him. It, it was really strange. Uh, there was two points where Kirk started to poke at the experts Health Canada brought. And uh, sometimes when you're sitting in court and your lawyer starts asking questions that you don't know the point of, you just start right away thinking like, what is he doing? He's wasting his time. And he was asking questions about where Dr. Obramovich came up with his expert report and uh, if anybody had helped him. And, and again, I didn't know what was, why he bothered, and actually Kirk didn't uh, know it was coming either, but um, at first Dr. Abramovich was defending his affidavit as his work, and, and no one really 
helped him, but then all of a sudden he admitted that his conclusions were written by his boss, that he had cut and pasted out of an email that was sent to him. And, and his boss is a director in a non-scientific department within Health Canada. So here we have their, their top scientists being told what his conclusions are. And uh, he, you know, he had swore to the judge that morning that this was his evidence, so the judge was, was not happy. Um, I think the judge would have been willing to strike out the uh, conclusions, at least of his affidavit, very quickly um, from the record. But Kirk didn't want to do that because it might give the Crown something to appeal and get a new trial on. So rather than strike the, uh, the, the affidavit or part of it from the record, Kirk let it stand and just told the judge that you can't give this expert any weight, that anything that he is saying is politically driven. Or was it also the part where he started talking like Yoda? Mentioned that oh, that was the crown. Uh, yeah, crown. that was the crown. Yeah, the crown was pretty funny. Um, he, he was acting strange as he started to, to, to lose, and he would say things like, that does not a, 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 char yeah, a charter violation make, um, uh, and, and do this Yoda like a little bit. Yeah, that was the crown was, uh, that was doing that, um, which is pretty funny, yeah. Um, yeah, when, when, when Obramovich admitted that you know, he hadn't written his own conclusions. You could just see the crowd just slinking in his chair. It's like, oh. it was it was pretty funny. Um, and so, uh, yeah. So we also had testifying four patients from our club. Um, three of them uh, had had licenses. One one didn't. Uh, talking about their medical uses and how they make uh, either their own extracts or or make make use of the club and. and what we have available, um, but ultimately it was Dr. Pate's testimony that convinced the judge uh, that the law was unconstitutional. And so uh, Friday, April the 13th, we got our decision last year um, where the judge uh, again ruled that the law is unconstitutional because it did not allow for uh, MMAR patients that, that have a license to make extracts. And uh, it, w it was only patients that he made uh, the, the or he ruled the law was in violation for. And so as of uh, last year, April 13th, uh, patients, um, uh, according to this decision, at least you know technically here in BC, if not, you know, it does apply to others in Canada, um, but it's not binding. Um, but uh, as of last April, um, you know, patients with the license from Health Canada can make whatever extract they want and they uh, are not uh, subject to prosecution. Um, that afternoon, uh, the judge talked with the lawyers about uh, uh, other issues, in, in particular uh, designated growers. Um, and uh, it was originally uh, decided, or maybe it happened two weeks later, because we had a couple hearings there, but uh, the judge decided, I think day one, that designated growers wouldn't have um, the ability to make and, and produce uh, extracts for, for their patients uh, uh, for a year. He wanted to give the government a, a year to come up with a, a way to, to manage um, the use of extracts by uh, patients and designated growers. Um, it's unfortunate that uh, we didn't have um, some evidence before the judge that uh, could have convinced him that people that were very sick needed a designated grower to make their medicine. The judge kind of had it both ways because he was being critical of us uh, and, and the number of patients that we were trying to get into the courtroom to testify, saying that he'd heard enough that we didn't need to, uh, to, to enter in patient testimony, that that was for the jury, not for the, the, the court. And, and then uh, when he put down his decision, he you know went the other direction and said that you know, we didn't provide all the evidence that he needed to make a stronger ruling. Um, but uh, regardless, uh, he said the designated growers had a, had a year. Um, now, the government wanted to appeal the decision right away, but they couldn't because the judge determined that the jury trial should still go ahead. That because we were selling to patients that don't have health care licenses, or essentially the public in the eyes of the court, um, that there's still a public interest in pursuing a, a trial. So. Uh, we set a 20-day jury trial at that point, and the Crown was unable to appeal because they needed a decision in order to appeal 
the what's called a void year, which is when the uh, technical decision on the constitution arguments was, was decided. And so uh, we kind of had the crown sort of rooked, where they couldn't appeal the decision, um, and uh, they couldn't force the trial. And so uh, we were scheduled this past month uh, to have a 20-day jury trial. Um, and uh, it was looking like that was going to happen until December, at which point the, uh, the Crown Prosecutor we were dealing with got sick, went to the hospital. Uh, senior lawyers in the Department of Justice looked at the file, realized it was a nightmare to proceed with uh, charges of uh, th this manner in front of a jury, and decided that they didn't want to go ahead. And so uh, the Department of Justice in early January um, entered no evidence into a criminal trial so that Owen could be found not guilty, um, w which is great, although they've appealed the decision right away, um, which we want to do. We want this to go to higher levels of court, especially based on the evidence that we were able to enter with Dr. Pate and the lack of evidence that the, the federal government has against us. We think that the Supreme Court of Canada uh, will rule in our favor and we want to go all that way. So, so going through the Court of Appeal is, is one step towards that. And uh, we're certain that it will go to the Supreme Court of Canada because it's a very important decision about whether pharmaceutical companies have the uh, full right uh, to own the, the chemicals that are in the cannabis plant or whether in fact patients can make their own medicines from this. It's absurd to think that we even have to argue that, but um, you know, I, I would like to think that the, the Supreme Court of Canada will, will see the, the light as it were. Um, in terms of the appeal, uh, it, it hasn't proceeded very far yet. We haven't got the transcripts or their factum, but what happens is they write their arguments and they send them to us um, in a factum, it's called. Then uh, we send a rebuttal to those arguments, and then we get in front of the Court of Appeal. So by the time we get in front of the three judges, they've read the original case, they've read the transcripts, they've read the first decision, then they've you know read the, the arguments and counter-arguments from both sides. Uh, before they even get up in, in front of the, uh, the lawyers. So um, we will be making all that information as public as possible. And uh, yeah, it should be hopefully before the summer. We'll see. There's no timeline set, which is frustrating. I said I'd end with a little bit about the new MMPR. Um, you know, the regulations taking away patients' rights to grow their own medicines is deplorable and needs to be fought in every way possible. So we've done what we can politically, but unfortunately uh, it, it's likely that these new regulations will come into law and it will be up to patients uh, and their caregivers to prove that these laws are unconstitutional and uh, especially given that the, the loss of licenses is going to potentially leave uh, patients subject to mandatory minimum sentences. Uh, and so um, it is uh, the, my belief and, and the belief of many others that uh, having established the, the right to use cannabis as medicine, uh, the courts will agree that one should have the right to grow their own. That hasn't happened yet though. Um, thus far in cases like Parker and Hitzig uh, and, and, and our earlier decisions, that the courts have, have agreed that a patient should have reasonable access to cannabis. Um, but there hasn't been a decision on whether or not a that means that a patient should be able to grow their own. Um, unfortunately, um, it, it might be that the courts determine that we do not have a right to grow our own, even though we have a right to access. Um, and that's because of the way the Charter of Rights is written. Um, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms has many sections in it. Um, section 7 is the right to the security of the person, and it covers um, most of the issues that people that use cannabis um, are argue for, pretty much all of the cases use Section 7 to argue essentially that uh, you know our security of the person has been threatened by this law and that the state is violating our rights. Um, that's been uh, agreed to by the courts uh, so often that it's not an issue anymore. But what we're faced with now is Section 1 arguments. Because what happens when you deal with the constitutional argument with the government is um, you use basically Section 2 to 15 uh, one of those sections to argue the government's been discriminatory or arbitrary or overbroad in, in its application of the law. 
Um, and after you've proven that, then the court looks at section one of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which determines whether or not the government has a vested interest in violating your rights for the sake of public peace, public security, and public order. And it may very well be that this is a, a situation where uh, the Crown is able to present evidence uh, sufficient to argue that giving individuals a license to grow their own cannabis puts the community at risk in a way that is um, uh, unnecessary and, and unfair if in fact patients have a constitutionally viable right and act or constitutional access to cannabis that's being grown commercially for them. And so there is a, a great danger uh, of that occurring and, and in essence of cannabis being legal here in Canada but not legal for any of us to grow unless we've got a large scale commercial operation. That's what is, is being our, you know, thought about right here and why it's so critical that we establish our, our right and our need to grow our own personal medicine uh, for a multitude of reasons. Uh, but we're in this danger period where if, if court decisions like Murnau continue to go the wrong way, uh, we won't have that right to grow, but we will, oddly enough, have the right to access it. I could go on for a long time. I know a few things about law. So, so coming March of next year, they're they're not getting rid of people's right to have medicinal marijuana. They're just getting rid of the right to grow. You can't get a permit to grow it anymore. Yeah. You can have it if, if you buy it from them or... Yeah. That's what it's turned to. So I'm more than happy to chat about some of these things here uh, as we get ready for 420 and stuff. But uh, I'd just like to thank everybody for coming. Uh, and uh, I should mention, Next week, I'm, I'm canceling the lecture. I've been too busy, and I didn't find somebody to do the social impact of cannabis, so, or of prohibition. So I apologize. I, I can't be here. I'm at a planning meeting in downtown Victoria with a bunch of planners and lawyers and stuff, so I kind of got the day off. So I'm going to try to put the word out that there isn't a lecture next week, but then we will be back the following week after that. I can't remember what it is, but we will be back. So thanks, everybody, for coming. Have a great day, and smoke a good